Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here live for Joyrider TV back with some more Q&A where we're going to be talking about the hottest topics in catamaran sailing in the Joyrider world right now. Um, so for those of you who haven't been before, what we do in these sessions is it is recorded live. Uh, so there is live chat going on even now um, as this is being recorded. So if you are thinking of coming next time, uh, come live. It's usually at six o'clock, six o'clock on Fridays, Greek time. Get involved in the live chat and I'll respond to everything in the live chat. Uh, but if you can't make it, just put a question in the comments and uh, I will respond next week. Thanks very much. Hello to everybody who's already here live. But as I have been doing lately, I'm just going to steam in with what I've decided is this week's lead question, which is, um, this has come in from Robin Poot, who says, question about wetsuits and dry suits. Uh, the shoulder season here in Toronto, Canada is five degrees C water temperature. Whoo. Uh, the air is 20 degrees in the spring and 5 to 10 in the fall. When would you use a wetsuit versus a dry suit? I think certainly um, 5 degrees water temperature, dry suit, 100%. In fact, um, 15 degrees centigrade water, I would still go for the dry suit. Um, I haven't been out. I'm going to be completely honest. I haven't been out sailing when it's been that cold for a very long time. And uh, to be honest, I never actually owned a dry suit. I don't think I've ever been sailing in water colder than, uh, it, I think, 15 degrees, I would think, maybe a bit colder. Um, but the dry suit brings with it so much more comfort. And it makes the experience pleasant rather than kind well, rather than unpleasant, which it'd be in a wetsuit, especially if you did go in the water. And you know, the worst bit about going sailing, especially if the wind is light, when it's cold, is actually launching the boat and having to wade into the water. And even if you've got a good quality wetsuit you are still going to feel it a bit if it is seriously cold. So 15 degrees or less, definitely go dry suit if you can, if you've got one or if you're about to go shopping. Um, and then the dry suit is more versatile than you might think because decent dry suits um, these days are all very made of the best breathable fabric. So even if it's starting to get quite warm, you just put less on underneath. You could just put like a Lycra suit on underneath or a Lycra top and uh, some shorts underneath um, just for comfort. And um, and then um, you, it will still work. Now, the downside of the dry suit is that if, if it's getting a bit hairy, and you go for a mega pitch pole and you go into, heaven forbid, but if you went into the rigging or something pointy and snagged it, if you put a little hole in the dry suit, it's not going to work anymore. So, <laughs> yeah, bad situation. You go for a pitch pole, snag the dry suit on the way past the mast on like a little sharp bit on the halyard or something, um, putting a little hole in it. Then you end up in the water, dry suit, filling up um, with icy cold water, not a good time. Um, which is what uh, one of the reasons why I was never aware of the dry suit. But to be honest, I was never sailing in water that cold. Sometimes, you know, once or twice. But also because I was um, windsurfing as well, where the dry suit wouldn't be uh, certainly wouldn't be uh, high fashion for windsurfing, uh, but 
I was using a very high quality winter wetsuit for windsurfing, which served very well for sailing as well. But um, to be honest, if you're just sailing, um, if you have the choice dry suit or wetsuit, I would go dry suit for when it's really cold. And then for when it starts warming up a bit, you could then step up to any sort of um, wetsuit. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to explain, because some of you out there might not actually know what a dry suit is. It's basically a completely waterproof suit, all one suit. I'm not going <laughs> to draw it. Um, it's an all-in-one suit that you wear, and it has a latex rubber seal that goes around the neck. Now, for some people, these seals can be uncomfortable. That might be a consideration. Go seal around the neck, seal around the wrists, latex again. Um, and then on the feet, it actually, um, the ones that I was more familiar with had molded boots. Um, and then you put your actual sailing boots on the outside. So underneath the this suit, oh, oh sorry, and then to get in and out, it would have a very high quality, completely waterproof zip, usually across there or between the shoulder blades, which might mean you need to get a friend to help you getting in or out of it. But um, yeah, and then underneath, you can basically wear whatever you want. You could go fully James Bond with your dinner jacket on underneath or um, the like a fleece suit underneath if it's really cold and your best socks very nice, cosy. Um, and then like balaclava for your bonts, helmet on top of that, and you'll be um, toasty. But um, yeah, there's a lot of different options with the wetsuits for when it does get a little bit warmer, or if you are going down the wetsuit route. And there was some numbers involved with wetsuits, which may not be completely obvious. So the numbers would be something like this. Uh, let's go for the warmest type of wetsuit, which would usually be a 5-3. And that means that the neoprene rubber that the wetsuit's made out of is five millimeters thick on the core parts of the body. And then on your arms and your legs, it would be three millimeters. So that's what these numbers mean. So 5-3 would be a very warm wetsuit, but the warmness does vary depending on the quality that you go for. It really does make a big difference. This is one area where if you think, yeah, it's going to be really cold, I'll get myself a cheap wetsuit, a cheap 5-3 wetsuit. The 5-3 wetsuit, it's going to keep you warm, but if you go in the water, the first thing that is less um, good on the cheap ones is the seams where it's been stitched together aren't as waterproof. So water is just going to come in through the seams and it's going to you're going to get a lot colder a lot sooner. The other thing with the cheaper wetsuits is they're not as stretchy. So you do feel very restricted in your ability to move in the cheaper wetsuits. So a cheap 5-3 would actually, uh, what, would it, what would we have next? A 4-3 would be the next thickness. So a cheap 5-3 would actually be the same sort of warmth as an, uh, a higher quality 4-3 wetsuit. And the 4-3 wetsuit would allow much greater movement as well. And you'll hardly feel like you're wearing it once you've got it on. Um, so if you can stretch to it, a, a higher up the range wetsuit is going to serve you well. Um, and then as we're getting warmer, so if we're going like really warm weather and cold water, like um, in Cape Town, South Africa, then perhaps a, a low three, two. Garda, Italy, where it could be very warm, but the water temperature, because Lake is, I believe, melted snow. 
uh, which apparently is quite cold. So um, good to have the suit, but um, you don't want to have something too warm because uh, hopefully you're not going to be in the water that much. So there we go. And then different types of wetsuit as well. Uh, we could go full suit, which would be with the full arms, full legs, or um, a good one for sailors is the summer suit, which is long legs, which is good for cat sailing because that will protect your knees uh, and short arms. So you could get a three, two summer suit. And then this is the curveball, which makes it more versatile. You could then get what is known as a hot top or thermal top, which would be like a one or two millimeter uh, long sleeve top that you could put on underneath it. So you've got the arms from the top showing and then the wetsuit with the short arms. So that will cover you in a really wide range of um, temperatures. Of course, if it's a bit colder um, or if it's really windy and the water's a bit cold and you're running a 3-2 summer suit with the short arms, you could also go for a spray top, which is uh, like basically just a waterproof top, which is specifically designed for, um, for sailing on a boat rather than like a casual jacket, which will absorb loads of water and get heavy and um, not be quite as good. Um, yeah, so that is, um, I think we have got a lot to go through today, by the way. So I think unless anybody's got anything else on the topic, I'm going to leave it there and check in with everybody who is checking in. Uh, starting off with Max in Rosenheim, Germany. Hello, Max. I have to stay lubricated, otherwise I start going croaky. Uh, oh, Max, on the topic, Max says, below 15 degrees water and air, dry suit is the best, in my opinion. Winter series, winter sailing, sorry, in Germany without a dry suit is nearly unthinkable. There you go. So in Germany would be the same as in Holland or um, uh, the north of the USA, Canada, definitely England, um, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, anywhere that cold. There we go. All right. Also in the live chat, we've got Joyrider TV in the live chat who says the latest speed stick results are up. Leland Lee is with us in Clearwater, Florida. Nice to have you with us, Lee. Um, Kevin is on board. Hello, Kevin, in uh, what's it called? Michigan, somewhere in deepest, darkest Michigan. Uh, <laughs> um, and I suppose it'd be morning time for everyone. I'll come on to your question shortly, Lee. Uh, Ryan's on board in Maui. I think Ryan's the earliest in the morning so far. Um, and by the way, if uh, you wanted to know, Ryan, Ryan has informed me that the bees are swarming, which is a very good thing. OK, we've got Ian on board in Pembrokeshire, UK. Aaron's with us in New Zealand, winning the Who's Got It Earliest in the Morning title. Once again, it's five o'clock in the morning here in New Zealand, but always worth an early start. Great stuff. All right, Hanny's with us in, uh, I think Hanny's in Amsterdam. And we've, we're running the Delft Cup again, Hanny. Thanks very much. Um, Ian says um, he's using a dry suit with uh, a woolly suit underneath in the UK at the moment. I'm sure Benny would be using a dry suit in Sweden if he was getting out on the water. Hello, Benny. Um, Lee says the water is too cold for me. I'm not going, period. And we've got Martin at Malcheski Composites on board. Great to have you with us, Martin. Um, and if you didn't know, um, Malcheski Composites are producing the finest quality telescopic and fixed length. I don't know if fixed length is off the shelf, but... Um, I really love my fixed length, I have to say. Uh, but the telescopic tiller extensions from Malcheski Composites are 
the finest out there. So do check out the website. I would show you one. I've got one in here somewhere, but I'm kind of trapped in the Q&A corner at the moment. So I won't um, at this time. All right. So on to Lee's question. He says, um, can you talk about mast bend, pre-bend? How much is too much? How much is too little? Is it needed? All right. So, um, and that's on a Hobie 16. So, all right. So, this question is, I think the word is an oxymoron, which means um, it kind of doesn't really, I'm afraid to say it doesn't really work because when we're talking about pre-bend um, on our mast, we're talking about boats which have, um, if this is the mast, which have diamond wires um, and spreaders, um, which uh, with the diamond wires and the spreaders combined, we can actually make the mast bent before we even put the sail up. Um, but if we're talking about if we just remove the word pre-bend, um, how much mast bend is acceptable on a Hobie 16? So on a boat which doesn't have diamond wires, we would be putting pre well, we would be bending the mast basically using. Now. Before we put the, the main sail up, can we actually, I've heard it talked about before, actually, to be fair, can we actually bend the mast on a 16 just with the tension in the jib halyard? Um, I think it would, personally, I think it would require a huge amount of tension because the jib halyard is coming to the same point as the shrouds. So, you know, if the jib halyard was going lower down the mast, yeah, it'd pull that bit of the mast forwards. But because it's going to the same point, the only bend which is going into the mast from the jib is going to be from, if we're pulling down really hard here, that's also going to be um, effectively pulling down here, which is going to, yes, this part of the mast is going to bend a bit. But to get that amount of, to get that part of the bend, uh, sorry, to get that bit of the mast to bend by pulling downwards on there is we're going to require a tremendous amount of rig tension. You know, as uh, if you take someone in a strongman competition and they crank it on as hard as they can with an Aussie jib halyard system, um, then they might be able to get it to bend. But I would be worried that something else is going to break before that part of the mast bends. Um, but and with the uh, rig tension on a 16, it would work the wrong way round because in the lighter winds yes we want as much rig tension as possible um to basically keep the mast as upright as possible to stop it from falling away to leeward so if we look at the boat from in front or behind um there's the mast straight up and then if the mark if the rig wasn't tight enough as soon as there's a bit of load in the rig, the mast is going to fall away to leeward, which is going to lose power for us, which in strong winds is really, really useful, especially on a boat like a 16, which doesn't have uh, diamond wires, powerful downhaul um, and other sophisticated methods of losing power. But in light winds, we definitely want it straight up. So, yes, we want maximum rig, rig tension on for the light winds. But 
if we put so much on that the mast bends, we don't want the mast to bend because when we bend the mast, what we're actually going to be doing is flattening the mainsail by bending the mast. Because the reason behind that is because even though it's subtle, in the luff, the front edge of the mainsail, which is just here, there's the rest of the sail going there. Um, there is a very subtle curve in the front edge of the sail. If we put that curved edge up against a straight edge, like if you're making a cone out of paper, um, is it? Probably not, actually. Um, but if you put a curved edge up against a straight edge, the rest of that material is going to get the maximum amount of curve into it, which is going to put more fullness into the sail, which is going to give us more power for the light winds, which is why we want a straight mast in lighter winds. But um, we do want a lot of rig tension, but we don't want so much that we're going to bend the mast. Um, so straight mast in light winds. And this is the same if we were going to really um, tune our boat up for the conditions. If we're sailing a boat with diamond wires, a, st a straight stiff mast, which means um, if we draw it in here. Sorry. That's not very good. Uh, that's not straight or stiff. So um, a straight stiff mast would be. Um, how would we do this? With the spreaders further forwards. And. Um, and still a high tension on the diamond wires that is going to give us the straightest, stiffest mast, which. If you were just sailing in light winds for a whole regatta, that would be a feasible thing to do. But the actual thing that is commonplace with boats with spreaders is you set the spreaders to your crew weight. Um, so if you're heavy, you have them further forwards, um, further in line with the mast to give us a straighter mast, more power. If you're lighter, you put them further back um, which helps to make it easier to bend the mast, less power. And then we change the tension in the diamond wires depending on the wind strength. So we'd have a range of, if we're measuring this on our rig tension gauge, we have uh, a range of about, what would it be, four or five on the rig tension gauge. So the smallest number might be 36 um, and we'd use that for the lightest wind to give us the straightest mast. And then as the wind increases, we'd start moving up towards 41, 42, something like that. OK, so. Um, yeah, so back to the 16. Yes, we can bend the mast. How do we bend the mast when the main sail is up? We bend the mast by putting on more downhaul because that is pulling down on the top of the mast, which uh, the top of the mast especially is completely unsupported. So if we pull down on the top, especially with some main sheet on, because uh, the main sheet is pulling the top of the mast backwards. So when we pull the top of the mast backwards, and we pull the downhaul to pull it down, um, then yes, that is going to bend the mast on the 16, which is going to really help to flatten the sail to make the boat easier to sail and more efficient in the heavier winds. So this is a strong reason why we put on a lot of downhaul when it's windy on any type of boat. Um, yeah, and there's a top tip in there as well. If you are wanting to get maximum amount of downhaul on, crank your main sheet in hard, like turn the boat right up into the wind, crank the main sheet in. Even if you've got your traveler out, it's still going to have good effect. Really wind it in both hands and that's going to pull the sail down and bend the mast, then pull the downhaul on. And you should find you could get another 
inch or two of downhaul on by sheeting the main sheet in first. Of course, be ready to uncleat it. Um, it is a little bit of a high risk strategy if you're sailing single handed. Um, but if you have got a crew, definitely it's a good uh, way of going about it. All right. So uh, proceeding. I hope that um, answers your question, Lee. It was a good question. I liked it. And we haven't had that one before, which is always nice to have a new question in the Q&A. Cheers. By the way, thought I'd, thought I'd mention this at this time. Major developments in the House of Joyrider um, here on Lefkas Island, Greece, is just yesterday I've installed Starlink. Yes, that's right. Um, I decided enough was enough uh, of the internet dropping out during the Q&A um, because on the old, um, what's it called, speed test, at best, getting with the 5G uh, internet I've been using, I've only been getting six or seven um, megabits per second, I think is what it's read in, uh, on the 5G. So I've invested in Starlink uh, from Mr. Musk himself. Yes, we've gone to space. Um, and um, in the tests, yesterday when I erected it, it it was a lot of fun. I've actually made a video about it, which will be on my other channel, one of my other channels. Um, I erected it. Yeah, I made a video about it because when I was researching it, whether it will work, there wasn't that much clarity. And um, I thought all the videos were pretty dull. Uh, so I thought I'd make my own. Um, yeah, so uh, immediately, really cloudy day. And in fact, there was quite a violent thunderstorm 10 minutes after I did the test. So really cloudy. And it was reading, I think, 48, which obviously is a huge boost. And then before I started going live uh, this evening, uh, I tested it again. And it's been a really sunny day today. Um, it was at high 70s. That's the fastest Internet I've ever experienced in my life. So thanks, everybody, for supporting the channel and going towards a faster internet. So thanks to all the channel members, everybody who's been supporting uh, the channel on Patreon, everybody who's been shopping at totaljoyrider.com. Um, it's things like this which your support is going towards to help to make this what we do here. Where's my fingers? What we do here better. Yes, it is. I'm at the moment considering buying another computer as well for the USA tour. Uh, that's, of course, going to be expensive. So if anybody does fancy hitting the super sticker button, you know, I'm not on the scrounge. I really don't want to be. But um, I have seemed to have been spending a lot of money of late um, with everything. Um, anyway, enough about me. Back to the live chat. All right. Um, so Kevin says uh, on the Hobie 16, do you prefer the Aussie system? Good question. Answer. Yeah, it's it's good. But. Um, as I might have mentioned in a video earlier this week, uh, we'll be coming on to that later, by the way. Um, I prefer not to drill more holes in the mast. Where there's not holes already, best not to put more fittings in the mast. So if your mast doesn't have the Aussie system, I would stick with the traditional jib halyard system because uh, with the Aussie system, you will have to drill. I'm just uh, doing some calculations in my mind at the moment. In fact, let's Let's explain what it is at the same time as calculating how many holes we'd have to drill. Here's the front of your mast. So you'd have to change your cleat. Uh, all right, here's the old mast. So on the old mast, you've got a horn cleat just here at the bottom where your jib halyard comes down to and ties off. So on the Aussie system, you've got a block 
at the base of the mast. And then you've got a block about, I'm going to say a meter, maybe it's a bit more higher up than that block. And then on the side of the mast, we're going to have a cam cleat. That's the cleat that works like that. Cam cleat. Um, so holes we're going to have to drill in the mast. We're going to have to take off this horn cleat and the holes from the horn cleat are going to be in the wrong place. So we'll have to seal those. Then we're going to have to drill. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If we go 3D, we could see why it's ten. Ten new holes in the mast to mount the Aussie system jib halyard. Now, that's ten more places that the mast might leak if the boat is inverted. Um yeah, I would say if you're really good at sealing um, sealing the mast when you're doing your riveting, then go for it. But otherwise, don't go for it. Uh, but does it work better? Yes, it's a bit easier to get the tension on because uh, the jib halyard comes down. Just to explain the whole system, for those who are not in the know, what we'll have. All right, which end should we start at? Let's start here. So this is this is the jib halyard. Goes through the cleat, around this one, around this one, and then we'll go up to the... Wrong. Well spotted. Up to the outside one there, outside one there, inside one there, inside one there and then it will go on to a becket here a becket is the bit on a block where the rope ties onto so we end up with a fair old bit of purchase there and it does make it a bit easier to get more rig tension on but you can get the right amount of rig tension on without needing this extra adjustment here in fact as soon as there's some boats rigged up in the Wild Wind Boat Park, I will demonstrate the best way of getting the right amount of rig tension on without this halyard system. So there we go. Yes, it's better. Should you upgrade? No, I would upgrade your downhaul first before upgrading, um, if at all, the jib halyard system. Definitely upgrade the top part of the jib halyard system with these two blocks. If um, And if you don't have them on your boat, Kevin, I will bring some with me to Ocean Springs so we can have a look there. But um, yeah, upgrade the jib halyard, uh, the blocks on the jib halyard, but keep the horn cleat at the bottom and then spend the money up, upgrading the downhaul. That's going to make a much bigger difference because that is actually going to mean you've got more options with changing the shape of your mainsail. All right. Thank you very much. OK, we've got Declan on board. Hello, Declan, the winner of the Malcheski Composites Tiller Extension from last year's Speed Stick Getaway Challenge. Yeah, um, it's probably coming up to time when uh, you're going to be wanting that in the post. Um, that's announcing to everyone that uh, there hasn't been one in the post yet. But Declan is in Sweden, where I believe uh, most people's uh, bits of water that where they would sail might be just about ready to start thawing out uh, anytime soon. All right. Declan says to the earlier dry suit versus wetsuit, I prefer a heavier wetsuit than a baggy dry suit. Perhaps I just haven't found a snug dry suit yet. Yeah, I think if you've if you've got a dry suit that doesn't fit very well, that's not going to be very helpful. And um, yeah, having a, if it's, I think if you're going to sail a lot 
when it's really cold, the dry suit is going to give you that much more comfort, though. And if what I used to do when I used to sail in the UK before I became a fair weather sailor um, was I used to have the wetsuit on. It would be a 5.3, but quite a cheap one because I was a student back then. And then I'd have a spray suit over the top, which is effectively the same as a dry suit, but not dry, just to keep the wind chill out and to and to stop getting soaked all the time. Um, so the actual flappiness of the dry suit, I don't think is an issue unless you're trying to smash it on the speed stick. But having said that, perhaps on the downwind leg, uh, the broad reach when you're going for the speed, um, maybe there's not too much flap. I don't know. Anyway, we've got Philip on board in Ireland. I'm going to Thailand tomorrow. Yes, that sounds like a good idea. Um, to loan a Hobie 18 for a week. Nice. That sounds like a great time. Can't make it to New Orleans. New Orleans. Uh, at least I'm sure of some sunshine. Very nice. All right, we got office hands Dave on board, Hobie 16 amateur hour. Tell your viewers in the Florida panhandle that you will be there in, uh, oh, here we go. This is news just in. We'll be at Fort Walton Beach from the 25th to the 27th of March. Just going to have to check these dates, Dave. Um, apologies to everyone who is not Dave at the moment. Um, all right. Yeah, I've actually got to be in Ocean Springs on the 27th. So um, on the evening of the 27th, because on the 28th, that is when Kevin is coming. Uh, and we're going to be heading out on his 16. So we might need to do a bit of a head scratcher on the second set of dates um, on the itinerary there, Dave. But um, yeah, but Fort Walton Be Beach, 25th, 27th of March. Sounds nice. I can't wait. All right. Uh, Jens is on board. Starlink. Very nice. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I think so far, so good. Let's hope so. Um, so, yeah, here we go. So Declan says, does Harry get the 5G link for himself? He does until we cancel it, basically. And then it will be back to when there's a live broad broadcast going on. Because obviously I do this. And then my wife is a yoga teacher. She teaches yoga live, I think, um, probably five times a week on five different days of the week. So quite often. And when anybody's doing a live online, then that means that my, our little boy uh, can't go online working his thumbs gaming. All right. Uh, Dave says Joe has um, mast hole a phobia, which is an irrational fear of mast holes. Or oh, Declan says a rational feel, fear of the mask sinking. All right. Answers on a postcard. We've got two on board in Texas. Great to have you with us too. Hans is on board in pretty chilly Germany. Uh, he says it's dry suit time. All right. We've got Dave 108 in, on board as well. Who says, I thought the Aussie halyard was invented so they could lean the mast back or tight rig while sailing. We could get too much tension on the old halyard uh, with the old system. Yeah, um, the reason for having the Aussie system, it does make it easier to get the tension on, but it does mean it is more, you can adjust it while you're sailing. Yes, uh, that is the truth. But unless you're, I think, unless you're taking part in competitions of a fairly high level you can probably live with the old system um and then if you need to change your rig tension between races then that is fine but um while you're actually on the race course it's a little bit too high risk 
to change the rig tension with the old system what during the race because because it is um but with the Aussie system yes you can change the rig tension mid race but if you're not racing not quite as important i would say all right so office hands dave says right we this is where where is joe and dave going to be in florida in march where is march in a couple of weeks we'll be in how do you pronounce this navar or navari uh florida 25th to the 27th of March. See you there. If you're there, see you there. Um, Toot says, Lake Buchanan is having an eclipse on April the 8th. Great stuff. Very nice. Uh, it's good that that's been lined up. All right. Uh, Dave says, give those Florida people my contact info if they want to stay in touch. Nice. All right. Will do. Uh, there's an eclipse regatta at Lake Buchanan on uh, April the 8th. All right. Martin uh, from Malcheski Composite says, I agree on the wetsuit with some sort of wind covering makes big difference. Yeah, I certainly used to think so. Uh, Declan's Lake still has 12 centimetres of ice on it. So it'll be a month before this year's sailing season starts. Uh, back to Martin, that said, the area you're sailing and chances of help in a short time is important. This is important. Um, yeah, so if if you might end up in the water with no chance of help, then what you wear is even more important. Like open ocean with an offshore wind, different than a small lake with 20 fishermen uh, nearby. Yeah, so if you're going to be going offshore, definitely, and you might end up in the water for an extended period, dry suit, better idea with some thermal stuff underneath. All right. Uh, Dave says, who won the sail um, design contest? Hot topic. Another one. Well, um, what I thought to keep... Um, you know, I wasn't going to announce it until the unveiling of the new sale. Um, I'm hoping that Chip at Whirlwind Sales will have that bad boy ready. Uh, the, the plan is that it's going to be ready um, for when I'm at Ocean Springs so I can actually bring it back, uh, smuggle it back in my suitcase um, to bring it back to Greece to stick the battens in, stick it up the mast and go Woo, like that. Um, yeah, so, um, I, I was going to announce who it was who designed the sale when I'm in Ocean Springs, if that's all right. If, yeah, Dave says we can wait. Great stuff. Yeah. I th and we'll do a grand unveiling. Maybe someone can lend us some battens for the main sale so we could chuck it up the mast, um, and have a look. Um, another feature that Chip at Whirlwind Sales is actually putting on that sale, the main sale is he's going to make a pocket uh, near to the tack of the mainsail where we can slip in the Velocitec speed puck like that. The pocket is going to have a uh, clear, is going to be clear. So we'll be able to see, we got any battery? Uh, maybe not. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, so we'll actually be able to see the numbers on the speed puck uh, looking at the sail without having to put it on the trampoline. Of course, we're only going to have this on one side of the sail. So uh, on port tack, we'll just be guessing. But that's OK. That's but It was the same when it was on the trampoline flat. You couldn't really see it anyway while you were sailing. So uh, this is going to be a big improvement. All right. Uh, Dave says, I'll bring battens. Great stuff. All right. We've got Werner on board. Greetings from Cape Town. Nice to have you with us. Werner, I hope um, it must be about time for a sundowner. Very nice, too. I've had so many good years in Cape Town. I absolutely love that place. Um, let's continue with the next preloaded question in the Q&A. If I can find it. Um, sorry, I'm multi-screening, which is from... 
Dajo4349, who says, and I dare say some of you out there in the live chat will be able to help with this. Um, he says, any advice or reviews on the Hobie 17 with just the mainsail? Um, there's a sport version with a jib. Looks, uh, he's just looking for a, a fun, relatively fast boat that you can sail up wind with two people without trapeze. Um, I haven't sailed a Hobie 17 for a long time. I'm not going to lie to you. But my memory of the Hobie 17 was, yes, it was great fun, is great fun, but it's not the easiest boat to sail because of the low volume hulls. The hulls are very low volume and um, for the size of the boat. And unlike boats like the Hobie 14 or Hobie 16, uh, it doesn't have a raised trampoline. So it is more prone to the water hitting the back beam, which um, is a thing. Uh, but the other thing with the low volume hulls is it means it is more prone to stalling. So uh, when you just get stuck and you just can't get the boat moving, uh, that's what we're calling stalling these days, um, much more prone to that than boats with bigger, more voluminous hulls. Now, if you want a boat that you can sail, which is fun, uh, which you don't have to trapeze on, I would say if if you can find one, one of the best options would be the Hobie 18 Magnum. Now, the Magnum basically means that it's got wings. Uh, the Hobie 18 is the same as the boats that I featured in the last episode of show us your cat. Very nice boat, loads of volume in the hulls. And um, you can sail it single handed without the jib. If the wind is a bit lighter, you can sail it single handed with the jib. And you've got like a real turbo boost on there. And there's more volume in the hulls, which means it's less prone to stalling, which means you're going to have a better time if you just want something which is a bit of fun. At the other end of the scale, the bit of fun scale, of course, is our good old friend, the Hobie Getaway, which is a smaller boat than the 17 or the 18. Um, but it, it's made of uh, it's molded out of plastic. So it's a bit heavier for the size, but it's also got the wings. So you don't need to trapeze unless you want to. And it's versatile enough so you can sail with one person two people or three people. If you were thinking Hobie 17, three adults on board, unless it was blowing, it mm, maybe. This is from my memory of back in the day. All right. So I noticed Toot has uh, inserted into the live chat. And I know that Toot had a Hobie 17. He said he's put a whirlwind square top uh, on it with a Prindle 18 jib and it screamed. Nice. Uh, Leland Lee says there is a Hobie 18 Magnum actually for sale in Clearwater, Florida. Nice. Uh, Toot says he still has a getaway and a Hobie wave. Yeah, nice. Uh, Declan's got a getaway, of course, and uh, he's got whirlwind sails on there and it can be made to go quite fast. I think 0.1 under 20 knots was Declan's top speed, which won him the stick. Yeah. So um, that is what I think in terms of the Hobie 17. Now, um, the negative point, of course, for the Hobie 18 Magnum is it's a lot of boat to pull out of the water if you're on your own. It's a heavy boat pull out of the water when you're on your own. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't say off the top of my head what the weight is of a Hobie 17, but it is going to be quite a bit less than a Hobie 18 Magnum. Um, so that would be the benefit of the 17. There we go. Thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in, by the way. This is a, a great session, I feel. 
All right, where else are we going uh, today? Yes, um, the hottest topic in the land has got to be uh, the video that I put out, uh, I think it was the day before yesterday, not the video that I put out, which shows all the finalists in the sale color design competition, which I thought was a nice little touch just to let everybody know what I had to choose from. And from everybody saying which one they'd have chosen, I'd have to say uh, the choice that I made perhaps isn't going to be the most popular one, but I thought it was appropriate um has come in actually from iron horse and it's just the question was i'm paraphrasing the question and it was just to summarize the takeaways from the uh the reaction video that i made about the video from sam holmes sailing about him taking a hobie 16 quite an old one if you haven't seen his video, I would suggest watching it because it is quite an eye opener. Um, so I did a reaction video about his video and his boat, which he took on a what I'd call a significant journey uh, for any small catamaran, yet alone uh, a rather aging Hobie 16, which uh, any any. Um, you might have even said it was kind of a little bit last legs. So um, I've made some notes here, actually. So I thought I'd go through some do's and don'ts. But actually, keeping it positive, I'd keep them. I'd just do do's before taking on such a voyage. Um, if you were ever to be thinking about taking on such a voyage. So I'm going to go through this reasonably quickly. Do stop me if you want me to linger on any points. First one, weather forecast. Really check the weather forecast um, as far in advance as you can, basically, so that you can see any systems that are nearby that might be moving in your direction. A great source of weather forecast, incidentally, which I use every day, um, is called Windy. And on Windy, it gives you a really good look at you can zoom in or out of where you are. So you can zoom out and see the whole world, basically, and what bits of weather. And then you can see which ways they are being forecast to be moving. So you can really see what is coming your way. And um, it's free and um, it's really nice to look at as well. And it does seem. Uh, for here anyway, because forecasts are different in reliability depending on where you are. But for here, it is really fairly reliable. We do, of course, have to dial in our local conditions as well, like the thermal effects we get from the mountains in Vasiliki Bay. Um, so really check the forecast and only even think about going if the forecast looks good. If the forecast has got a little bit of a, hmm, yeah, 70% should be okay. You need it to be 99% will be okay before you think about taking on a, a voyage of that magnitude, I would say. Because it is the weather that is really going to scupper you. Um, weather, mast falling down, breakages. Those are the things that are going to scupper you more. Uh, sea creatures, perhaps, if you're in Australia, definitely. Uh, if you're in Cape Town, mm, yeah, uh, perhaps. All right, so check the forecast. Number two on the list of do's before taking on a voyage of any kind of magnitude. If you can, change the rigging, the standing rigging. Change your trapeze wires as well. If you haven't changed them in the last five years, um, perhaps if it's fresh water, um, maybe you're, you're sailing in the Great Lakes, uh, then you still want to be looking at cha changing your rigging every five or six years. Uh, if it's salt water more frequently, because that salt in the air is going to degrade uh, the metal and your rigging is more likely to break sooner. 
and a mast coming. If you can imagine, if you have seen either my React's video or Sam's video, if his mast had come down, the mess with all of the all of the gear on the boat, plus a mast down, bits of wire everywhere, sails. God, it would have been horrific. So definitely worth changing, uh, changing the rigging. Um, as well as changing the rigging, what might be not be op obvious is if your boat uses a wire main halyard, change the main halyard as well at the same time as the rigging. Because a snapped main halyard, you can, yes, you can overcome it by just lashing the sail to the top of the mast. But to do that, you have to capsize the boat. And with such a lot of gear on the boat, you certainly wouldn't want to be doing that. Um, all right, next one. Check everything on the boat. Double check everything on the boat. Look at every single part and think, just really take a magnifying glass. Well, don't really take one, but a metaphorical magnifying glass, looking at every part of the boat going, is this part going to let me down? And then if you think less than 99%, okay, we're going to change it. Um, might end up costing a bit of money, but better than what could happen if something failed, of course. Um, and fix everything that you can. And the biggest example of that on Sam's video is, you know, tune the rudders up a bit. I would definitely make the boat handle as nicely as possible before taking on that sort of voyage. All right. What else have we got? This is important as well. You might not even have thought about this, but in a controlled environment, practice capsize writing. If you haven't capsized before and or, and righted the boat, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to pull it back upright if you're away from land um, with no support. Um, because if you're doing it for your first time, it's going to be very stressful and you don't know if the mast's going to leak, boat's going to invert really quickly, how the boat is going to respond. See if you can practice a capsize writing with your gear on the boat to see what happens with the gear. What um, I can't remember who it was who said it in the comments to that reaction video, but the weight of the gear on the tr trampoline if it is attached to the trampoline, we're going to draw a picture because this was a pretty significant point that I absolutely hadn't thought of. But if the boat is capsized in the kind of half capsized position, maybe you can see where I'm going with this already. But if you've got a jambalaya of stuff on the trampoline, Maybe this is 20 kilos of stuff on the trampoline, maybe more. Where This is where the boat is pivoting. That is, um, yeah, I'm not an uh, engineer, so I don't actually know what that would be called. Is that the fulcrum uh, of writing moment or something? But all of that weight is the wrong side of the fulcrum, which is going to pull the boat upside down super quickly. Um, yes, Sam had the masthead float. Very sensible indeed. But even with a masthead float, if you're really loading up the trampoline with gear, yeah. So practice your capsize writing in a controlled environment. You know, a good week or two or a month or some, as soon as you think that you're going to be... Um, going on a voyage, uh, think, right, first thing we need to do is make sure we know how to bring the boat back upright if we capsize. Make sure, you know, you and whoever you're going to be sailing with. And then if you need to, then you might think we, we should probably get a bag, a writing bag. Check out the video if you haven't seen it, of course. Um, yeah, so um, key point there. <clears throat> All right, next point. On the um, on the uh, the key points is I wrote I called it 
pack well. Yeah, there is our boat. Um, what I would do if I was going on a camping trip, Hobie 16, is I would really think about every single item that is going on the boat. For um, food, uh, I would think, what is the uh, the lightest, easiest to pack food? Look at what the astronauts do, or the people on the on the uh, round the world racing yachts, or the non-stop round the world racing yachts. What they take for food, and maybe that should be a consideration. Of course, if you're just going on a camping trip where you're going one stop up the coast, then yeah, um, drag a boat behind your boat loaded up with your barbecue and um and your steaks and sausages and uh bread rolls ketchup uh all of the good stuff Sp some sort of spicy sauce maybe and your um your keg of beer nice but if you're doing a a big crossing less is definitely going to be better for the safety uh maybe not for your survival but um and then i would put it can we see this just behind the front beam in a bag like um almost ideal for this i don't know if you've seen but chris picknally who is the guy who does the beautiful painted sails has started producing some big sail bags one of these big sail bags would be the right width to go across the trampoline there at the front and then you just attach that to the trampoline or the front beam and then put your gear in there it is going to make it more difficult to use the jib with that bag there of course but we've got to make some considerations the reason it wants to go there and not further back if you put it further back it's going to make it a bit more difficult to have good trim on the boat and your boat's going to go more slowly but you could experiment with bag position and how the boat is sitting in the water. Um, if you're going to take an anchor, take a folding anchor, definitely. Um, and for a, if you're going to anchor in a good place, you know, with a, the right sort of bottom, then a, a fairly small anchor should be enough to hold a 16. With definitely drop the sails if you're going to anchor the boat and anchor it somewhere sheltered if you can. And then a small anchor should be sufficient. Um, what else? Next one. This is quite a big point. Is dress warmer than you think you need to. Because if you're out sailing, it's a lovely sunny day. You've just got your shorts on. Um, and um, the wind starts picking up and picking up, picking up. You're going to find it more difficult to stop to put on more clothes and putting on more clothes when it's windy and maybe it's getting rough, the sea's getting a bit up and down, it's going to be very difficult. So always dress perhaps one or two grades warmer than you think you need to. Also, once you start getting cold, it's going to be much more difficult to warm up again. Um, so dress warmer earlier than you think you need to. Um, the one point I didn't mention in the video, yes, of course I'd clocked it, but I didn't mention it. Why didn't I mention it? I didn't want to be too patronizing. I think that's what it was. I have had quite a lot of stick um, in the comments from the video. Uh, not, it felt like a lot of stick anyway, just for making the video in the first place. Um, it was actually quite upsetting the amount of stick that I was getting for making the video. But if by making that video, I can stop one person from making a mistake that could cost them their lives, then it's worth doing. That's what I think. And that's what I think with all of this stuff that I'm doing. If I can stop somebody from making a massive mistake, then great. I've, I've done a good job. Um, but buoyancy aids or some sort of personal flotation device of course, um, you should be wearing personal flotation device at all times. Uh, the only time when I think you can 
discard uh, not wear a personal flotation device would be in zero wind when you're on totally flat water and um, you're quite near to shore with an on and any wind there is is going to blow you back to the shore. Otherwise, it should definitely be on. If there's no wind at all, so little wind that you actually decide to go for a swim, then OK. But any more wind than that, you should have a buoyancy aid on. Um, all right. Next one. Maybe clip in. Yes. Uh, so uh, you may have seen from last year, I did some testing on clipping in so that if you did fall off the boat, you'd be attached at all times. Um, I think that's worth considering. Definitely keep a hand on the main sheet at all times because it's the main sheet which is going to stop you from capsizing. Uh, Traveler's going to help. Other settings are going to help. But the main sheet is the most prominent thing that is going to help. Hope everyone's uh, enjoying this, by the way. Uh, there's quite a lot going on. All right. Um, safety equipment. Um, take things to communicate with. So um, take a spare phone. Take some way of charging your phone. Take a VHF. Uh, take flares and a emergency beacon and other safety gear that you can get your hands on. Um, so I'm actually, you know, having watched Sam's video quite a few times and his other distance sailing videos, I've decided as part of my my future life, I'm going to do some more long distance sailing because I haven't really done that much um, unless it's been a race. Um, but to go perhaps around the Greek islands as a little warm up. Um, and then the big one, this, I'm just going to lay this down now, is I, the dream, which you may think this is a rubbish, this is a terrible dream. But the dream is, here we go, picture this. I'm going to take the mini cat, which is in, it goes in two bags, which you can carry. Uh, I might take a skateboard or something to ease the carrying just so I can roll it. I'm going to take the mini cat uh, on the ferry to um, Brindisi in Italy and then sail the mini cat back across the Adriatic uh, to Corfu, Greece. I think that would be flipping epic. But um, I've been having plenty of conversations with the wife about this. Oh, no. She doesn't talk like that. But um, for the, pit, set for the uh, purpose of right now, she does. Oh, no, you're not going to do that. I don't want you drowning in the middle of the sea with your boat sinking. I said, funnily enough, that's not my intention either. But, um, yeah, but, I, but that's a ridiculous idea. But um, I would fancy it, actually, just to see if it was possible. Um, yeah, so take all the safety gear possible. Um, and then a big do is, if in doubt at all, don't go. That's got to be the biggest takeaway from all of this. If in doubt at all, don't go. And then um, and then I had to have to say that what Sam did was absolutely amazing. Um, but I would strongly recommend against doing uh, anything like what he did. And if you are thinking of doing some distance sailing, stay close to land with some sort with the uh, prevailing or gradient wind, uh, which is going to blow you back to the shore if something bad happens. So if your mast does fall down, you're going to get blown back to the shore rather than away from it. So there's some takeaways from that video. Um, that's a reacts video to my own video. Um, so I hope that was of some use. Uh, just going to clear up the live chat. And then I think that's pretty much us done. No further questions, please, by the way. All right. So Dave 108 says, any info on the future of fiberglass Hobie cats being built? I heard they stopped building them. No, uh, Hobie cats still building fiberglass boats. Um, they're still building. I have to think about this. Hobie 16s and Hobie 14s. Definitely. So if you want to buy a Hobie 14 or a 16, 
Uh, yes, you can buy one. Hobie 15s as well, I believe. Um, what else would there be? Yeah, that is it for the fiberglass boats, which are available kind of off the peg at the moment. So uh, that you could just order one and not have to wait for a year. Um, then there are other boats available, which you can still buy, such as the, uh, what was that? What was, uh, uh, the Wildcat you can still buy, but you would it would be built to order. The same thing, if you wanted to get a brand new Hobie Tiger, you could do, but they would build it to order. Um, Hobie Pacific, they'll still have the molds for those. So if you wanted one, they'd still build it to order. But maybe the glory days of uh, Hobie Cat, unfortunately, are behind us. But who knows what the future may bring. Fingers crossed. All right, we've got a, a sailing vessel, African Queen, on board. Great to have you with us. Any advice on uh -huh, foldable or dismountable Hobie Cat so I can fit one on a boat? Any manufacturers you could recommend? Uh, thank you for a good video. Yes, um, I could recommend something exactly, which is exactly what you're looking for. And that is the Mini Cat. Um, yeah, check out Mini Cat. And the one that I have, in fact, on the channel on Joyrider TV, you'll see my unboxing right through to first time out video with the Mini Cat. Uh, it's really fun boat to sail, easy to put together and stores in two bags, which are, I can't remember the dimensions. They're about a meter and a half long each. And these two bags have the whole boat uh, stored in them. I think the complete weight of the 420 is about 60 kilograms. So if you've been working out, you can carry the whole boat in the two bags. I think they call it a farmer's walk. There you go. So that's mini cat, M-I-N-I-C-A-T. Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, Declan agrees. Yes, it's the fulcrum. Thanks, Declan. All right. Dave says, I had a bag that I bought in the 70s that went under the trampoline up front on the 16. We kept life jackets and a paddle in there. Oh, yeah. Pack a paddle. That's, yeah, I'm going to do that, actually. Um, yeah, that's a good shout. If you could get a bag that goes underneath the front of the trampoline, work out a good way of securing that. Now, that would be a very good decision. Uh, of course, that's going to get a bit wetter. That's the only downside. All right. Toot says April the 27th and 28th is the Lake Buchanan Sailing Club Regatta. Put it in your diary. If you're in Texas that weekend, you've got no excuse for not attending. Get down there. Send me some pictures. All right. Um, Philip says, try to sail around Ireland this year. Weather was too bad last year. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. A friend of mine, uh, two friends of mine, in fact, did sail around Ireland. Um, I, I can't remember if they actually completed it, but they did it on two boat, uh, two single handed boats called Shadows, which were a bit like the FX one. Um, mainsail, spinnaker, single-handed trapeze, dagger boards. Looked like a great time. Uh, absolutely mega. Yeah, so good luck with that if you are going. Declan says, good advice. And great that you did your commentary video on Sam's. Um, as Sam's video emphasizes the romantic view. There we go. Uh, Toot says, I need to sail a Hobie 14 Turbo. Yes, you do. Um, everybody needs to be initiated on the Hobie 14 Turbo. Uh, Philip says, come over for a few days. Guinness is pretty good over here too. Yeah, I'll put it on the, um, I'll put it on the uh, list of place. The list of places where I'd like to visit is, I'd have to say, pretty long. Um, but, you know, now that I have retired from the day job, 
all that I need is um, the approval from, let's call it the approval from upstairs and um, a bit of cash to get there. There we go. All right. Aaron is uh, Aaron in New Zealand says your advice has saved me on many occasions. Declan's advice, however. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, Declan responds with a question mark. OK, African Queen, thanks for reading my comment. Yes, mini cat I will look at, but would like solid hulls are the mini. Yeah, the mini cats are inflatable. Now, a solid hulled boat, which would be easily. Um, that's more tricky. That is more tricky to have something that's small enough to make it uh, convenient and easy enough to assemble. Now, that is the trick shot. Um, but what I'll do, because nothing is coming to mind at the moment, but what I'll do is I'll keep it in mind and then uh, perhaps in next week's Q&A, if I thought of anything, I will let you know at that time. All right, so I think that brings us up to date. Must be time for a beer here in Greece as it is now nine, uh, 7 21 in the evening and the thirst is getting pretty rich thanks to everybody for tuning in um sign up for the newsletter uh if you want to keep chatting amongst yourselves that we have got a discord server the link to that is in the description below so you can head over there if you want to continue chatting thanks very much phil for the super sticker all right i'm going to hang around for a few minutes uh if anybody else wants to follow philip's lead um because the super sticker uh does do well in helping to pay for skynet or whatever it's called which is now beaming these images funny thing is that we actually watched um the starlink or spacex or whatever the brand is um, chain of satellites when they were being dragged across the sky when they were first being put out. Amazing. Incredible. All right. Dave says it's 721 a.m. Wow. Where'd you say you are, Dave? 801? I just. Uh, that's like, like the other the other end of the day. Go. You've got. I could tell you today was pretty good, actually. Um, so you've got a lot to look forward to. Um, I'm like a time traveler here. Yeah, Martin says, yes, not a personal attack on anyone. Years ago, I did some sailing and I am alive today, but there was no reason to take the risk. I simply did not understand the dangers I was putting myself in. Declan, thanks very much for the super sticker. Very kind. Um, and uh, all right, African Queen, thank you so much, Joyrider. Have a great afternoon. Happy sailing. Happy sailing to everybody who's going to be get happy weekend to everyone who's get who's um around this weekend. Uh, out if you get out on the water, the speed stick is calling you, and uh, the link to the speed stick is actually maybe I've still got it uh saved on the clipboard. So can I? Can I do that? No. All right. It's not still saved on the clipboard. Never mind. All right. Duke's going ultimate 20 racing tomorrow. Wow. That is pretty cool, Duke. Um, if you've got a GPS with you, uh, see what you get out of the ultimate 20. Get on the stick. All right. Duke says uh, we watch SpaceX launches from the water in Ventura, California. You can hear the sonic boom. Amazing. Uh, okay, Declan says, happy weekend to everyone. Stay safe out there. Nice one, Hanny. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, I'm going to clock off there. So thanks very much. We might, there's a slim chance there might be a new Show Us Your Cat this Sunday, but I'm not sure if I'm going to have enough time because i um, got jobs to do. Thanks very much. <laughs>